welcome everyone to uh, Language Testing's uh, second webinar of this year. The title of this webinar is Curating Your Digital Research Profile. In this webinar, we're going to be talking about some tools that you can use as researchers uh, to leverage your di digital identity and also some ways that you can, um, you can share your research materials and data uh, with the academic community. Um, a bit about myself, my name is Dylan Burton. I am the Editorial Assistant for Language Testing. Um, I work with uh, Paula Winky, who's here right now, and also Luke Harding. And um, I'm also a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. All right, so the agenda for today is that we're going to focus on kind of four key areas. We're going to focus on ORCID IDs. Um, we'll move on to talk for quite a bit about open science and open science platforms, uh, data repositories. Uh, we'll move on to peer review recognition through Publons, and then we'll also talk about some resources to promote your publications uh, in the academic community. Uh, we'll wrap that up with a question and answer session at the end. So the presentation bit should take about uh, 20 minutes or so. And then the final bit, uh, Q&A, we can leave open for 10 to 15 minutes at the end. A bit of housekeeping, the recording is in progress. Um, I'm only recording my shared screen. Uh, so feel free to, to leave your, your, your cameras on or off. It's no problem. You're not going to be included in the recording. Uh, the video at the end will be shared on YouTube, so you can access this information later. Um, so please save your questions until the end so that I can make sure that uh, that the video is just myself talking um, at the beginning. All right, so ORCID IDs. What are ORCID IDs? Um, one of the problems in academia is that there are a lot of names that are very, very similar or the same um, across publications um, and, and across many different fields. And so it's uh, become quite difficult to keep track of who is who. Uh, if you see, for example, a citation of Smith 2020, which Smith is that? So ORCID is a platform that gives um, researchers a very, very specific number. It's kind of like a national identification number or a social security number um, that gives you a very specific identity. You're the only person with a number so that that can be associated with academic manuscripts and um, other uh, digital platforms. So think of it as kind of a common language that we use uh, across the Internet. Uh, the great thing about ORCID IDs is that it connects with journals, it connects with grant institutions, um, the Open Science Framework and Publons, which we're going to talk about today, um, and also academic registries. I've got a couple of examples here on the screen of how ORCID can be used. Um, here, this is with the Open Science Framework. Um, you can actually log in and create your own account with your ORCID ID without having to create a separate account, which is really handy. Um, but it's also used in publications. So here at the bottom, we see uh, Paula and Luke's recent editorial. And you can see their ORCID IDs are tied to their names in the manuscript. On the manuscript page, if you hover over the ID, you can actually get their ID and you can find more information about them and their other publications. So it's really, really handy. Um, when you go to the main ORCID ID page, this is what the landing looks like. So this is my own example. You can see here that there is a specific ORCID number. Uh, this number is unique and it's only for me. Um, and then you can curate all of the information on this page. So you have the, the option of including biographical data, um, your employment data, um, all of your university data, for example. But really, the power of ORCID lies in how it tracks your publications. Um, it is linked with Crossref. And so anytime you publish something, be it a book chapter or a journal article, if that um, publisher is linked with Crossref, your publications and your citations, your publications, sorry, your references will appear here directly. So you don't have to track them manually. Uh, for some journals, they're not tied with ORCID yet, and you may have to enter that information in manually. Um, but if there is a conflict, um, ORCID will resolve those conflicts within the system. So it's really, really handy for keeping track of what you've published and also to promote that to others. Um, it's easy to associate your ORCID ID with uh, many journals. So, for example, with language testing, it's very, very seamless. 
in your author account. Um, if you don't have an ORCID ID associated yet, this is what it will look like. And you can see at the very top of your um, edit your account details, you can create an ORCID ID if you don't have one, or you can associate your existing ORCID ID here at the top. Um, and for language testing, first authors have to have an ORCID ID. It's required in the system. Um, so it is recommendable for everyone to do this. Once you've done this, um, within your details, the, here are mine, um, you can see that my ORCID ID is associated here at the top, and I can update that or remove it if I wanted to. Uh, for example, if I needed to create a new account in language testing for some reason, I would have to remove this ORCID ID and associate it with the new account that I was creating, but that's a very rare occurrence. Okay, now moving on to open science. This is a really big topic in the field right now of applied linguistics. We've seen a lot published on this. Um, and in language testing, it's still something that's sort of, um, it, it's still growing within our field um, is what we think. So what is open science? Open science is really a set of practices that aims to, to, to make science transparent, to make our publications more accessible to others, uh, not only other academics, of course, but also to the broader uh, society in general. Um, open science encourages transparency in our practices. Um, the aim is to reduce bias um, in our findings um, and also to provide avenues for replications and secondary analyses as we know that these are great ways to support the field and support findings. Um, there are many ways that you can practice open science and applied linguistics. Uh, some of these examples are through pre-registrations, uh, publishing a document before your study, um, or at least stating your hypotheses and your claims and your methods before you begin the study. Another way is through registered reports, where you take that pre-registration and you actually, uh, it goes through peer review, um, and so other people give you critiques on your, um, on your study before it ever happens. Uh, Preprints, which is where a manuscript is uh, uploaded to a digital repository before, um, before it goes to peer review. Open materials and data, where people um, share their materials and data with the academic community so that, that um, those findings can be uh, rerun and reanalyzed. And then finally, open access publications after an article has been published. Now, uh, language testing is supporting many of these open access um, and open science practices. And uh, I would encourage you to read Luke and Paula's recent editorial, which is in the latest issue of language testing, where they talk through many of the rationales for why we're doing this um, and the different types of new manuscripts that the, uh, the journal is supporting. Now, for those that practice open science, the open science framework will award you a badge, and this will be tied to your manuscript. So if we look at the language testing table of contents um, in our online first uh, section, we have some nice examples. So this paper by Nicklin and Vito has just been published, and these authors shared materials and data. The materials they shared was R code, uh, where you can actually rerun a simulation they used in the study. Um, so they got two badges for this, the two badges representing open data and open materials. And this is available in the table of contents. And it's also available in the PDF of the manuscript. You can see the badges here. And also at the end of the manuscript, there's a data accessibility statement. Now, one of the interesting things about using the Open Science Framework in particular, but uh, so, uh, sharing your materials and data in general, is that you can actually cite yourself once the manuscript is published. So you get your badges, you have your, your um, data repository, which we're going to talk about, but then you can see that Nicklin was able to, um, to self-cite this data set in his own paper. Um, so this is a major advantage because this links to his data set, um, which other people can then go in and look at and run those analyses. So there are many data repositories that you could use um, in your open science practices. Um, one of the most well-known ones is IRIS. This is run by applied ling linguists in our field. And what it is is a repository for materials. So it's a collection of, for example, um, instruments used in studies, of surveys, of tests that have been used. Um, and it's, they're all freely available. Um, they do come with a stable URL. Uh, it doesn't come with a DOI. Um, but it's quite helpful for people that are designing studies so they don't have to design their instruments from the ground up. 
Uh, the Open Science Framework is one that I prefer to use. Um, it's a repository that supports a full range of projects, um, actually a complete range. You can upload pre-registrations, uh, full projects, data, materials, and other things. Uh, these can be made private only for your own use or for your team's use, and they can be public as well. And one of the main benefits of using the Open Science Framework is that if, if you um, if you have your project there, you will get a DOI, a digital object identifier, um, if that project is public. And then um, that's a stable URL that will exist potentially forever that will link to your content. Finally, there are a number of other databases such as ISPER, um, which is run by the University of Michigan, and there are many other examples of repositories of data in particular. Uh, some grants require data to go into these repositories, so um, this might be institution specific whether these need to be used or not, so definitely consult with your local institutions. Now, one of the more interesting things that, that we're not seeing a lot of people do nowadays is um, sharing materials and data with peer reviewers through these repositories. There's been a long tradition of this through supplementary files, though, um, within journals. So we know that as supplementary files, we share, for example, appendices, we might share instruments, um, and we might even share some data with a journal. Um, if you use a data repository, though, you can actually share a lot more, and you can share it in a way where you organize the contents of the file folders, metadata, and all of this. Um, what we see is that in the Open Science Framework, for example, People uh, often share R code, they can share video and audio, and it's really just a complex and very rich source of information for peer reviewers for them to actually take a really nice look at uh, your study. Another nice thing about using a repository for peer review is that you maintain that control and the ability to curate your own data even after the publication of your, of your article. If these things are, are submitted as supplementary files to a journal, you lose that ability. It becomes static and it can't, can't be easily modified at least. Um, and there's also sort of an, an unsaid limit to the amount of supplementary files that you can upload with a journal as a publication simply because there's not space for that. Uh, one or two files generally is what we see. Um, with a repository, you can share as much as you want. Um, and it can provide anonymity, which I'm going to walk you through during the peer review process. And as I've said a few times afterwards, once the project is done and you make the uh, your repository public, you do get a DOI and a full reference um, for your data set. So to do anonymization for peer review, it's really straightforward. Um, what you do is you create a project in the Open Science Framework. This is a project that I've um, that I have that's ongoing, um, and what you do is you open it up and, and you see here the information about the project. You've got my name, you've got the DOI because my project is public now, and you can see the category as well as the licensing for my for my project. If you want to create a link that's anonymous for peer reviews to use in a manuscript, you click up here in the top right hand corner, the three dots, then you click create only uh, view only link. It will open up this page that has a link here that's, that's specifically for peer review. And this is really, really handy because when you're writing a manuscript, if you want to refer to your instruments or your data set for peer review without the reviewer seeing your name, so you remain anonymous and blinded, you just plug in this link. So for example, in the method section, uh, the full documentation of my instruments is available at this link, boom, in the manuscript. And also, for example, if you want to share your data or your R code in the same way. What the, um, what the reader will see when they click on this link is a similar page, but without your name. So all that information is blinded. Um, if your project is uh, private, um, the DOI won't appear either. So it's, there's, uh, you know, it's harder to, to unblind your identity that way. So um, once the manuscript goes through peer review, if your paper gets accepted, what you can then do is take these links out and then cite yourself, cite the data set um, with a full reference uh, at the end of the document. Now, if you practice open science, um, in order to get credit for it with the badges, this is how you can do that. So in the submissions uh, portal that we have in Scholar One, 
at the end of the very first page, uh, type title and abstract, um, you will see a section for open science badges. Now these are the badges that I just showed you a minute ago, uh, the three types. So let's imagine that, for example, I shared data. I would go over here and I'd, I'd click yes. Then the next step for me to do is to download the disclosure form, uh, to fill it out in full, and it's going to require uh, you to include the link to your data set that you have. Um, and then you save this and you upload it as a third or a fourth file in your submissions. So make sure to keep this file on you. Um, other files you might include here, apart from the main document in the title page, might be your tables and your figures, etc. Um, so if you want those badges at the end of your manuscript, you have to upload this form, and this can be done at any point during the peer review process. Okay, the th third main point is talking about getting recognition for your peer review. So one of the big problems in all of academia is, is that we conduct a lot of service for the field. We do peer reviews, but there's almost no way to track what we're doing. And so one year you might do 15 peer reviews, you might do 20, and that's an incredible amount of service, time out of your day. But how do you prove to your department? How do you prove to your employer what you've done? How do you get credit for that? Um, so one recent way that's uh, come about is this service called Publons, and it's a service that actually tracks those peer reviews. Um, this might be useful for a range of different purposes, uh, end of year evaluations, promotions, job applications, who knows. But it's actually really straightforward in our system. Uh, in Sage, at the end of your peer review, you will see a box that looks like this. Do you want to get recognition? And I think because Publons isn't well known about, a lot of people just click no, like what is this? But what will happen is if you have a Publons account already that you can create directly with your ORCID ID, you click yes, and then that information feeds directly into your profile and immediately you get credit for your peer review. Uh, so it's incredibly handy. And this is what it looks like. So you go to the main Publons page and you can see that you can sign in using your ORCID ID. Definitely do this um, so that you don't create a different account and information gets mixed up. Um, on the page, you'll see different options. Um, this is sort of the, uh, the toolbar. And under Manage Your Reviews, this is where you can make sure all of your reviews are present. So at the moment, not all publishers work with Publons. Sage does. I'm not sure how many others do. Um, so Sage will upload these directly, automatically. If you find that you did a peer review and it's not there, um, tracked automatically, you would click on Manage My Reviews, you would put in the information, and then what uh, Publons does is they communicate directly with the publisher to verify your peer reviews. So they go back and forth to make sure that that information is accurate. Um, once you have all of this together and you're satisfied with it, you can ex export your Publon CV. And what you get is a whole CV full of documentation that tells um, whoever is going to read this document about all of the peer review that you've done. So here's mine uh, from the past three years, and you can see that it gives us a nice graph of the number of peer reviews that I've done. Somehow in 2020 I did eight. Um, and you can see who I did the reviews for. So we've got language testing, TESOL quarterly, etc. cetera. Um, so then you can actually use this. This is concrete evidence of what you've done that's been verified by Publons um, with other uh, publishers. All right, so the fourth main point is tracking and sharing your publications and citations. Uh, we've talked about the first two. Both ORCID and Publons will track your publications and they'll give you information about citations. Um, and they're great to put on any sort of academic profile you might have uh, because you will get a link for both of those. Um, but I also want to talk about a couple of other services. Now, I'm going to spend some time on Google Scholar and Twitter on the next couple of slides. Uh, and I'm not going to spend much time here, but ResearchGate and Academia.edu are um, social media platforms for academics. Um, they allow you to share information about your projects. Um, I see a lot of preprints on these. I see a lot of documentation before uh, projects actually go public in, a, in an article. So you can actually stay current on what people are doing and the work that they're doing. They also have some nice services for sharing um, for sharing your articles for people that are behind a paywall that don't have university libraries. 
So I have my, uh, my publications as private files in ResearchGate, and sometimes people can ask for permission to view it, and I can easily um, give them that access without making it publish, uh, public and um, having any sort of conflicts with the publisher. Uh, so you can share your data privately, of course, your articles. But to talk about Google Scholar, so we all know Google Scholar as a resource for doing a lit review, right, for searching for information online. Uh, but you can also use Google Scholar to create your own profile. Now, you have to do this yourself. It's not automatic. Um, and unfortunately, it's not linked with uh, ORCID. Uh, so there's no automatic listings, unfortunately. But if you set up a profile, what happens is if somebody searches for a manuscript and they come up with your name, um, if you have a profile, you'll have a link that you click on and it takes you to a page with all of your publications in that link. And one of the nice things about Google Scholar is that it also tells you the number of citations that that person might have. Um, and so they do a ranking based on um, different metrics that they have within the system. But again, you have to set this up yourself. So you will find that um, sometimes authors don't have it set up, so it's impossible to see any information about their past uh, papers. So I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, another key resource, really key resource for, um, for us in the field is Twitter. Now this is our Twitter page for the journal here, um, which is at Lang Test Journal. And um, what this does is, you know, Twitter can give you, it can give you access to a lot of information you don't want, but if you follow academics, um, you can stay current on, on these daily updates. Um, for language testing, for example, we post anytime an article goes up in online first. We post information about calls for special issues. Um, we post whenever our issues come out. So there's a lot of information that we share. Um, through this portal. And then we also have a lot of information from our editors and from our editorial board. Uh, here's, um, here are the Twitter handles for um, our editors. So I'd encourage you to use it. Um, there's great reason to, to publish or to, to promote your own papers on Twitter because there is some evidence that it actually generates more citations. This is a paper from the Medical Sciences where they looked at a range of different studies, whether they had promoted their studies on Twitter or not, and they found that those that had promoted themselves on Twitter actually generated more citations and more academic interest. So it does have a durable quality to it. All right, that's all that I have to talk about um, with the content of the session. I do want to mention that we have an upcoming third webinar for the year. It's gonna be hosted within the program of LTRC, so it won't be um, a free webinar like this one, um, but the topic of that webinar is getting published in language testing and assessment journals. And um, there'll be a range of editors from different language testing journals there, in particular our two editors, Paula and Luke. And that's gonna take place on March the 10th at 8 a.m. Eastern, one o'clock UK and 10 o'clock Japan. Um, so if you are registered for LTRC, um, you will have access to this webinar, and I'd encourage you to go to it. And finally, um, here's um, our information from the journal. If you have any questions, you can email me at my work email at LTSS, and I'll help you with any admin or questions um, about anything we've seen today. Uh, follow us on Twitter. We also have a YouTube account where we're posting our webinars. The first webinar that we held on new manuscript types is there. And also our associate editor, uh, Ruslan Suvorov, is posting uh, Glenn Fulcher's podcasts, which were originally audio only, to our YouTube channel so that they'll have a we sort of guarantee their longevity in the system. Um, and if you want to ask me any personal questions or follow me on Twitter, my information is here.